or uh, do you, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Just, uh, no, I am fine. Introduce yourself. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Stanislav Kozina. I work as a manager in Red Hat, and I will be talking about um, detecting the Linux kernel ABI changes. I will try to cover how do we, how you can actually do it today, and how maybe you could improve your process if you care about kernel modules ABI and, and what you can do. And I will also finish with maybe possible future ways where we could be heading. So I hope it will be interesting at least a little bit for all of you. I will start with really the very basic motivation. So let's say what are, um, what are the kernel modules? Uh, there's an upstream Linux kernel which contains some VM Linux as core and a bunch of other kernel modules. And all of that is as a part of a single Git repository. And upstream Linux community makes sure that everything what is in that repository stays compatible as it is. But there are some other modules which live elsewhere in other repositories, maybe internal to some companies. And, and some of these kernel modules are, are fairly cool. I've listed OpenAFS and OpenZFS uh, as a two of them. The first one is distributed file system. Uh, the other one is, um, let's say, storage management and file system mixture. They kind of have to stay outside of the Linux repository even despite they are open source, because their licenses are incompatible with the GPL. So, so you can't make them part of the Linux project any time. There's no way they could ever become open sourced. So the right long, long way term how to solve this is unfortunately to write from scratch something which would deliver the same features or better features under the GPL license or under some license which would be compatible, hmm, probably GPL license, and make it part of upstream Linux project. But before that happens, there are people who, who need some of these modules because they use it daily because they need some features. There are many others, other modules. I'm sure anybody can think about some other kernel modules which they might need for a certain purpose. A lot of the other modules are closed source, which will not become part of the Linux repository until somebody who knows, uh, who, who holds the rights to decide a license for these modules decides they in mind. Linux has a stable user land ABI. As Linux Torvalds is saying, like any application which at any point in the history has been working fine on some Linux kernel, it needs to work on any future Linux kernels. If a kernel update breaks your application, it's the kernel's fault. That's what we can briefly call the stable user land ABI. So, so it definitely covers all syscalls or structures which you pass between user land and, and kernel, but it also covers a lot of file nodes uh, like uh, procfs. That's, that's very well known. Uh, but there is no stable interface for the kernel modules on purpose. And it's a very strong decision, so it's very very, very unlikely there will ever be stable kernel interface for kernel modules. There is a nice write-up by uh, Greg Korn-Hartman as a part of the Linux sources where he explains why they have done this decision and how you can deal with this. That's just a mandatory slide to make a clear distinction between API and ABI, briefly speaking. If you can always run your source code against some other library or kernel, that's when we talk about API, the program interface. If your source code is written in one of the languages which is compiled, and you can, after you compile it, you can still run it against the library or kernel without recompilation, that's where, when we would talk about ABI. So sometimes it's a little bit confusing, you know, um, Obviously, for languages which are not compiled, like Python, there's just API. There isn't such a thing as ABI. But, but for C source code, which is the language of the Linux kernel, it's a fairly clear distinction that if you would have to recompile your modules, but you don't need to touch your source code, that would mean stable API. If you don't need to recompile your modules, that would mean ABI. At some specific cases, one is easier than the other. For example, API means that you can't 
rename your enums, right? While ABI means that you can rename them, but you must not change their, their numbers. So it's, if you think about it, I'm, I'm sure uh, you can easily figure out what is what and everybody knows it. So how it, what do Linux, well, what do Linux kernel can do for you as of today if you have some third party module and you would like to run this module across a line of kernels without recompilation. So what kind of stable ABI you can find in the Linux kernel? By default, Linux kernel, when it loads kernel modules, it requires the, uh, the version for which the module has been compiled to be the same as the current version of the kernel. So aka you have to recompile your modules with every kernel update for that specific kernel. But there's a config option, config mod versions, which uh, tries to do somehow a comparison between um, the functions which are required by the modules and these functions in the kernel, what is the version of these functions, and if these functions are compatible, then you can load your kernel module without recompilation. If, if they change, you can't, and the kernel will tell you like, no, no, I won't load this. So you start with enabling config mod versions. Um, I have a little code here. Um, so I've wrote a kernel module which has three lines of code. There is a function which calls print case, which just prints something in a, in a kernel buffer, and this function is exported. When I compile this as a kernel module, you would find uh, a, a magical symbol in the symbol table, which is a, um, of type absolute. So actually, value of that symbol in the symbol table is absolute value, which is a check, uh, checksum of that symbol which is provided by this kernel module. And you can easily check this using the NM tool, which is a tool which prints the symbol table of your binary. Um, this is one thing. This is about the symbols which your module offers to all other modules. On the other hand, your module can depend on other symbols provided by other modules. So this is what you can test easily calling mod probe dump, dump mod versions, and it will list you which modules you need and also the checksums of the modules you need to run your module. Um, so at the end, this builds a graph of dependency between the kernel modules, and that mod is the tool which just builds a graph, and when you, tell, when you ask mod probe to load some module, it will use the database generated by that mod of the dependencies between the kernel modules, and it will figure out if you can load it or, or, or not. Um, what mod probe dumb mod versions is doing, um, it's really just looking at uh, an elf section versions which is where the checksums of required symbols are stored. So there's a hex dump, but you can see that uh, I'm running a little Indian machine, so the, the checksum is just, just turned in little Indian, but it's the same checksum as is printed by, by mod probe. How all of this works, if you're curious, um, in your kernel module, you use the export symbol macro, which just expands to uh, the GCC attribute which asks the compiler to put some structure in ksymtab section and ksymtab um, strings actually. When this section is created, um, there is a, some little code in makefile build which will use object dump to detect that this section exists. It will call gen ksyms like this. Um, so if you see, uh, uh, you can see call of the GCC preprocessor, that's the GCC-E, um, the, the three points that means you need to use all your GCC options, which is like 10 lines of code. Um, so it will pipe the output of the GCC preprocessor directly into the GenKSIMS tool, and that one will just echo the list of functions you are using from the rest of the kernel with the right checksums you need. So GenKSIMS is the tool fairly admirable tool which parses the C source code and will just generate all the checksums you need. Uh, later there are some post-processing done by the kernel make files so um, basically it will just uh, these checksums are later post-processed in the form of a linker script which will just create uh, yet another section with some structure which lists these checksums and this, is, this linker script is used by linker to link it to your binaries so your binary 
then contain some information about, about the symbols you need and some other metadata information. And by the very end of the build system, they also generate the module Simverse files, which are just text files which list the functions your module is provided. So there's some a little bit non-trivial tool chain which takes care about all of this, but it's, it's not that hard, really. Um, as an example, I, I just listed uh, uh, yeah, um, so the mod post at the end of the build process, that's the tool which needs to list the symbols which you need from the rest of the kernel so later that mod can, can figure out if your module can be loaded on a given kernel. So the mod post will just generate the source code of yet another object file which you link into your final kernel module which lists the symbol you need in the section called versions and that's the one which mod probe can list to tell you what symbols you need. There are some neat tricks which might tell you more about how Jenkins sims works, aka how, how it computes the final checksum. Um, so again, I have an example of a kernel module which in this case has even six lines of code. It's just a function which works with some structure as an example. You can call Jenkins sims, uh, you see it in the other um, diff, you see that I'm again calling GCC with the processor option and I piped it into Jenkins sims, but this time there is option dash capital, capital T which creates the file file.sim types file. And this file contains all the types which Jenkins sims parsed out of the source code and they are like subtypes. So you can see that, that, that uh, my func is a, is a function which is an argument there's a pointer to some other type. And the other type is foo underscore t, which is a type def of some other type. And the other type is s hash foo, which is a structure foo with some nested basic types. So this is how Jenkins sims can actually tell you what are the subtypes being used during the computation of, of the final, final checksum. And let's say that when the kernel changes and you would like to know what has really changed in the kernel, you can easily generate the same, ty same types file for the old version and for the new version and just diff them using the normal diff and you can see what specific types have changed between these two kernel versions and figure out um, what to do with that. This is even supported by, uh, by the make kernel make files. So um, I just, as an example, picked out the i40e kernel module, which is the network arc from Intel, which exports two symbols. Uh, you can run for each C source code file, which is used to compile this module, you can call make and a full, address, full path to this C source code file. You just replace the .c with the .sim types, and it will generate the file sim types, which is exactly this file, which lists all the types which are being used to compute the final, final checksum. So this is how it works as of today, and this is what you can use. Um, there are some things which are not that handy, and that's the fact that the way how it's all computed is that there is a magical tool, GenGaySims, which parses the C source codes. So anytime somebody would invent some new feature in the C language, you also need to patch GenGaySims to understand this feature. And also, because it works on, on a strings, if you modify your strings significantly, it will result in a, in a different checksum. So just an, uh, as an example, I'm using, um, previously, my kernel, module, uh, ker my kernel module contains structure foo, which contains two integers, n a, a and b, but they are defined on the same line. So if you just change your source code to put these two integers on two different lines, it will result to a different checksum because this is a different string. So it's hashed differently. You have different checksum. And although your ABI obviously has not changed, there are still two integers next to each other, the, the Jenkins sims will generate different checksum, so you won't be able to load your module because the checksum is different. So it's not handy. Um, you can be smarter. Um, I'm quite some time I'm saying that the right tool to parse the C source code language is called compiler and GCC is pretty good about it. So let's use GCC to parse the source codes and just work with GCC for whatever output it has. 
Um, so GCC can generate the Dwarf debug information, which is very easily parsable graph of all the types GCC found in your object file. Um, so there are a couple of very simple tools. The very well-known one is libabigail. That's a huge set of a library and a lot of tools which can just parse all the Dwarf data in all the versions, in all all the languages you can think about, all the libraries, all the features you can find there, and can work with these data to tell you how ABI has changed between two binary objects, what, whatever it means. We have also one much smaller and much trivial tool, which is called KBIDW. That one works only for the kernel modules, only for Linux kernel. It's much simpler. And it, but it basically does the same. It also just reads the Dwarf data and compares the two graphs and tells you uh, how it differs. So how you could use it is that, let's say that you have, um, at one day you, you have a structure foo which contains two integers, A and B. But then some, sometime later somebody changes the structure and he, and he adds a new integer into the structure. And he also reformats the code a little bit. So there's int A, B on the same line, and there's int C on the new line. So you can use the KBIDW tool to generate the type information of the first version, then the type information of the other version, and you can just compare the result together, and it'll just tell you that you have added one more integer. So in this case, it, it won't tell you that you have changed the source code, um, but it, it will just, just tell you that there's something new. Mm. So we have five minutes, so I'll stop talking and, and show you this as a live demo, but because I can't hold the microphone, I'll, I'll just turn it off. Sorry. Knock, knock. This still works. Wonderful. So this is the source code of my module. Um, you can see it works with the foo underscore t type, which is stored in a header file. But the structure is really just two integers. So I will now run the KBIDW to generate the data. Then I will modify it, generate it again, and then I will compare it so you can see the result. I have to compile it with the config debug info enabled so that var data are generated as, as part of the build. Um, you see it really doesn't take much time. Eight milliseconds are pretty much enough to parse this trivial information. For all Linux kernel, that would take about one minute. It's, it's not much. It's not a little, but still doable. Yes, so the comparison run you see that takes only three milliseconds. That one even for the all Linux kernel takes about 10 seconds or even last six seconds. It was fairly, no, even much, much less I think it was. Um, and, and you see that one variable was removed because I compared them in the reverse order. I, I, on the first, as a first argument, I used the other and then, then the first. So this is what you can use to detect the differences between ABI of a bunch of kernel modules. In the future, we could actually use the Dwarf data as the base of the checksum computation because the checksums are still fairly handy for runtime detection. 
All of this needs to be done during compile time, while in runtime, when you try to load a module, you really want to have some safety mechanism which would tell you, like, no, this is incompatible. Don't load kernel module using different ABI into your live kernel. It, it will just destroy everything. There are some issues which can't be solved by tools like this one. For example, if you have just declarations of certain types, and then you suddenly add the definitions for the tools, you can't generate just a unique hash if you don't know how deep in the graph to go, which declarations to ignore and which definitions to take into account when you are computing this. So it, so it won't solve anything, but it might be more stable, let's say. Awesome. So that was 20 minutes for me. Um, we have some space for some discussion. Do we have any questions? Oh, there is one. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, the question is how the content of the two directories look like, and I wanted to show that, and I forget. So in the first directory, we have just three files, one function, one structure, and one type def. It's uh, the output of the Jenkinsims had three lines. There was a function, a type def, and a structure. So in this case, we don't have three lines, we have three files, and they look like so the first file says that the CU is the compilation unit. We don't care about it because we do some other business. Uh, file, just ignore that. What is important is the symbol and whatever goes later. So under that, we say this type, which is the function my function, is actually a function, which is called my function, and its argument is pointer to, and there's ampersand. The ampersand says you need to take a look at other file to figure out what is this. So this would be what GenkSims is using with the hashes. We used ampersand for this as a pointer between the files. So now you would have to look at the file typedef to figure out what's the argument. And the argument is a typedef to, oh, you need to add the other file, which is structure foo, to figure out what, what this typedef actually points to. So how does the structure foo look like? And the structure foo contains two um, fields, and we have their offsets. So this is what we actually care about. What are the offsets of all the fields in all the structures? And this is what, what we can detect. This is what, what we actually compare for, for our, all the things. Thanks. Any more questions? Uh, thank you. The question was, um, GCC sometimes produces incorrect VARF information. There are some regressions. So how do we see the reliability of tools based on DWARF for ABI comparison? And the answer is yes. GCC does generate bad DWARF information, and we have had issues with that. So we have been filling bugs in GCC and working with GCC community to, to get them fixed because this is a major issue. It's just jeopardize all of it. It is a valid and major concern, but we believe that we just need to fix GCC. It's dwarf information should be correct. So we'll, we'll work some time, we will fix GCC, and we'll add some tests to it, and then it should be all good, right? <laughs> Thanks. Any more questions? Awesome. Thank you very much. We are right out of time, so perfect. Thank you very much, and see you next time. Yeah, only HDMI. Yeah. Uh, HDMI is not uh, exactly working here. Good morning. So Good morning. If you... Good morning.
I had one of the last time. Okay, so I will take my USB. Some complaints about it.